And we're back on. Okay, great. So we're looking at this lick. So we have the root and the third of an A chord. And then we go in minor thirds up chromatically. But the, the second... That second one is replicating the two chord, the B minor of the key of A, but then they go into chromatic heaven. And this is the root, uh, the third and the fifth of B7. Okay. And then we come back. That's um, that's a move that I've complained about. Yet it does, it does kind of the it it's. You can get away with this move, and the Beatles used it a lot. Uh, I think you have to be careful with it, but the B7, just simply going back to A for no good reason. <laughs> and I know there's some sort of hidden reason why. Maybe it's the... No, it's, it's not the tritone. The only excuse I could find for B7 going back to A is that if, if we tritone substituted it, we'd get an F7. Which is definitely a resolution sound. Okay. Um, all right. So B seven, B seven. Then we have the long. The worst drum solo in, in recorded history. <laughs> Thank you, Ringo. You, Ringo. I love you, man. <laughs> Uh, Ringo was perfect for the Beatles, no question, and he was great in his own way. He was, I think of him more as a colorist than an actual kind of funky get mm -hmm. there and get down and groove kind of drummer. Um, and actually some of my favorite drummers I've worked with are kind of orchestral in their approach. For example, uh, Stuart Copeland is kind of an orchestral drummer in ways, okay. you know. Because he's looking, not many drummers play color, that's, that's the deal. And it's hard to get color from drums. So that's one thing Ringo was really, really good at. And it's been the psychedelic days, you know. I mean, if you look at the uh, kettle drum stuff he did with uh, A Day in a Life, it was, it, was fun. Oh. it was great. It was great. So uh, anyway, after that, then we get into rock and roll. And it's just... This is blues, A7 and D7, which we had that theme <laughs> earlier with She Came In Through the Bathroom Window. Right. Right. I don't know all the lead parts, um, but <laughs> some of them you could tell who's who. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds like Eric Clapton, and there was a... Um, Conspiracy theory going around that actor, Eric Clapton, well, it's not a conspiracy theory, but people were saying that Clapton joined in on that medley, but he didn't. Oh. It was Harrison being well influenced by Eric Clapton because they were buds at the time, and, uh, you know, he greatly, Harrison greatly admired Eric Clapton's oh, playing. Oh, okay. Um, and he also, he also, I mean, the Beatles, you know, uh, Harrison was actually very wise uh, in ways. He, uh, like when the Beatles were having hell on Let It Be, he invited Billy Preston in because he knew they would all, like, behave if a, if a new person was involved. Oh, really? Yeah. That's why he brought in Harrison on While My Guitar Gently Weeps during the White Album. Um, and probably that's why he brought, uh, um, well, no. No, not on... I think Billy Preston actually does play on this record. But I'm not 100% sure on that. Hmm. Uh... But uh, you hear Lennox. Uh, and then all that stuff. Uh, but you know, <laughs> this is what it sounds like a freaking washing machine. Uh, 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 how's it? Uh, Something like that. But you can tell it's Lennon. He's mm -hmm. doing like these uh, Chuck Berry licks. On oh, it. okay. Uh, yeah, so I, that's a, it's a great moment on the record where all the Beatles get to shine, you know. 
And even Ringo, they gave him a drum solo. Yeah. You know? it, that was really like a very cool moment. He must have been stunned. <laughs> and again, it changed everything. You know, I mean, if you look at like uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer took a classical version of this idea and did the, the Mussorgsky's uh, pictures at an exhibition, mm -hmm. you know, which is naturally like a medley, you know. Uh, but this this changed everything. A lot of people began to like tie songs together and you know demonstrate their uh, you know virtuosity, yeah. you know like that. So it really, really all of a sudden progressive rock. You know when they heard Let It Be, I mean when they heard Abbey Road, Let It Rock. Uh, um, oh my God, my brain. When they heard when the other musicians heard Abbey Road, they said Let's get really intelligent like the Beatles are. Oh. And let's try to surpass their intelligence, which they never could, but, hmm. you know. So you had, yes, you had, who else? Uh, you had yes. King Crimson was kind of like a entity unto themselves, but I'm sure there was some influence there, too. Okay. Uh, Emerson, Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer. But the cool thing about a lot of those bands is that they weren't trying to sound like the Beatles, and I do respect them for that, you know. Yes, I mean, they had a remarkable ability to create really interesting... Uh, it's just a, a display of musicianship and interesting chord changes and interesting melodies, but it still leaves me flat because there's a certain... One thing I can't deal with is attitude and pretension amongst musicians. Like... I know music theory, so I'm better than everyone else, oh. you know, that sort of thing. You get that in a lot of jazz musicians, you know. Um, but the coolest ones are never like that. They're never like that. I've always said, like, you know, when I lived down in Austin, uh, I, I just couldn't believe it. I was, you know, I had friends that wanted to introduce me to the jazz circles, the really good top players, you know. So I'd go to this place, the Elephant Room, and I was introduced to these guys. And they would not give me the time of freaking Oh, day. really? But yet, in New York City, I'm talking to guys who later, you know, became well-known jazz musicians um, on their own. We're playing on these wedding gigs and stuff. Oh, is that right? And I'm thinking specifically of this guy, Gary Dial, brilliant piano player, brilliant. And uh, uh, he, we would sit over at the table and we'd talk music theory tricks and, you know, oh, you can replace this chord with that and get that. And i go, oh, cool, I've got to try that out. Huh. So the New York jazzers, man, they have no need to feel insecure because they know they're good. And yeah. they don't have to show people, oh, I'm, you know, who I am or uh. whatever. Where the Austin guys, you know, they're competing with L.A. and New York. So it was like, no, we're going to protect our little clan uh, here. Yeah, we got know. turf. We're, we're going to be the top dogs. You know? Sure. Always bug me about Austin. I love the city, but it's very cliquish. And, and anybody will tell you that that's, mm -hmm. that's lived there, even natives to Austin will tell you that. Huh. You know, but uh, and still, still there's <laughs> there's something about Austin and being a guitar player. Uh, being in Austin for five years changed my guitar playing. It huh. did. I was very much influenced by some of these guys that unbelievable uh, guitar players, just all over the place. You know. Was Nashville like that? Oh yeah, but I would imagine. I've never been in Nashville, but I imagine. You know, there was like a, a, an exodus of L.A. Music, uh, session guys that went to Nashville because oh, yeah. the money was there. Yeah. You know? So yeah, there's like some really hot guitar players, man. <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, my sort of my uh, understanding of it is literally you can kind of knock on a door, and about every other door you'll find a musician. That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. And the competition for even songwriting is very, very yeah. intense. I got a buddy. He's from New York. Recently moved to Florida and wants to get the hell out of there now, but uh, he wants to move to Nashville. Uh -huh. He's a singer song. He's a songwriter, not a singer songwriter. He's a songwriter and he's song peddler. You know, he wants uh -huh. to make the big money sure. writing a great pop song. He called go. me up yesterday, like, I'm writing this song, and can you give me an idea how to transition to the F chord in this section? And I'm listening to it over the phone. And I'm going, well, how about a D minor with a G bass? You know. <laughs> He's like, oh, I never, I never used that chord before. Yeah, you can. <laughs> well, there we are. Jeez. Well, I, so I've talked to some of these folks that are, you know, they were hired on contractual songwriters in Nashville, and you know, the the day is just weird. You know, nine o'clock, they they'll they'll team up people. So nine o'clock, your your duo will sort of have coffee, mm -hmm. and then they will sort of start on. They they would take me through, or you know, one of the teachers would take me through 
sort of a real life session, you know, of uh, uh, trying to find something, and all of the blind alleys, and the stuff where you know, hey, they they uh, they had little. They have little phrases for, uh, no, let's move on, instead of, no, let's move on. <laughs> they'd have, uh, you know, they'd have some other little phrase that would mean, let's try this, or let's, let's dump this completely, all of this. But, um, yeah, the whole team writing thing, I think, it, again, they swear some great stuff has come out of it. You know, one teacher, he's been in the business 35 years, well, he's sold 3,500 songs. That sort of... Yeah. You, uh, group writing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think I've told you I've endeavored... Uh, we do that in the blue kind, and it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. Um, uh, but it's in a kind of rehearsal setting. Like, we've been rehearsing the set, and then maybe I'll come up with a progression, or Pete will come up with a bass line, or whatever. And, uh, oh, that's kind of cool. What if we, you know, can we chuck that chord in there? And, you know, can we do this? And it's really nice to see how a song gets sculpted out through a yeah. group process. And it's not always comfortable to do that because, you know, everybody's ego is on the line. Oh, I sure. have an idea, yeah, but that sucks, you know. In fact, the, ba <laughs> the bassist, when he sends emails out, always signs it Nixon. <laughs> and the reason why is because, you know, I would complain because every time I threw an idea out, the bassist would nix the idea. Okay. So I called him Nixon. <laughs> he kind of stuck. <laughs> Oh, that's not bad. All right, why don't we, we have enough time to finish this off. Give me another five minutes. Can we do that? Or, or Well, we have about three and a half. <laughs> oh, to get to the yeah. 15 months. Okay, we're just about to the end. And really, uh, wow, it's almost uh, an emotional moment for me going through all these Beatles mm -hmm. and we're done. You yeah. Know? So we should start over and I should give a more in-depth analysis of the early stuff. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Because, you know, if you remember the early stuff, I just kind of took whole albums and went, this is this, and that's that, and that's that, let's move on to the next album. So yeah. I never really... There were a lot of songs we missed, too, you know, a lot of the singles we didn't do. Okay. Did, like, I Am the Walrus, did we ever do that? We talked about it. I know we talked about it at one point. But I don't think we did any kind of in-depthy thing. Maybe I'll look at the singles and we'll go through some of those. Yeah. From early to late, you know, um because they really are worthy of looking at. I mean, Lady Madonna we haven't looked at. I don't know if we did Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane. I mean, I've talked a lot about Penny Lane before. Yeah, we talked a lot about it. I remember that. I think probably Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane we actually did uh, en route to Sgt. Pepper's. I think there there was a, yeah, I think there was a session that dealt with both of those. Yeah. All right, well, we're almost toward the end, and... Uh, so, well, okay. see you next uh, time we get together. Let's put 